live with Sheik Alfan Al Aisri. On, on, let's connect. Let's connect. Assalamu alaikum. Dear listeners, welcome to your Ramadan radio program, Let's Connect. We'll be connected together on a blessed journey in the month of Ramadan to establish the most important connection in our life and be the best of who we are. We also welcome you to call in at 2460258. With you here is your host, Reem Audia, with the Honorable Sheikh Alfan Al Aisri, who will take us on this blessed journey and the sound engineer, Safiya Al-Habsi. From all of us here, Ramadan Mubarak and welcome again. Sheikh Al-Fan, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Reem. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to you and to our dear listeners and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam. So let's connect, Sheikh Al-Fan. Here we are in the first day of Ramadan. And oftentimes, year by year, we welcome the month with so much excitement, with high spirits, And then on the last day, we look back and we say, only if we made the best of it. And then we say, next year, I'll do better. So this is our chance to have a solid start and make the best of this month. And before we do that, we would like to first connect with the concept of Ramadan. So, Sheikh Al-Fan, what is the purpose of Ramadan? No. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala uh, The month of Ramadan comes every year. Uh, it's a gift from Allah. It's an opportunity for Muslims to reorient themselves between uh, the values and their behaviors. It is also an opportunity to uplift oneself with hope as individuals become devout in the month of Ramadan and try to establish that connection with Allah, with self and with people. And uh, Almighty Allah has described why fasting has been prescribed. He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مَنْ قَبْلِكُمْ or you who believe, fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you. Why? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain piety. What is piety? Piety is about doing what is right. It's becoming righteous. Righteous is about becoming a right person. Mm-hmm. Mentally, emotionally, physically and spiritually. Uh, it is also awakening the conscience. Because most of the time, whether we like it or not, as human beings, sometimes we get distracted. We get distracted from our true purpose and our true mission in life. Uh, And in that distraction, then people go different uh, paths. So the month of Ramadan comes and says, let us go to the right path, Mm -hmm. to the main path. Let us reconnect. Let us allow our gyroscope that is pointing true north. So we align our compass with our gyro. gyro. Mm -hmm. In other words, it is about bringing together our behaviors, attitude and action with our values, principles, and standards to make sure that they are aligned and they are congruent. Both of them are pointing in the same direction. If we do so, then the inner struggle they dissolves and disappears. Beautiful. So you've mentioned how it's a gift from Allah, a chance for us to reorient the self and also to reconnect with our values, our principles. No. So I'd like to take the concept of values as well. What are the values that we can learn from the month of Ramadan? No. Islam always subscribes to the highest moral values of uh, human beings. Let us take, for example, sincerity. Let us take faithfulness. Let us take honesty. Let us take uh, truthfulness. Let us take respect. All of these values... And more of these values, humility, humbleness, uh, empathy, uh, uh, it goes all the way to thinking about others, mercy towards others, forgiveness, overcoming our negative uh, emotions such as uh, anxiety, hatred, animosity, uh, envy, uh, getting rid of all those negatives and acquiring or establishing or surfacing the positive moral values. And uh, those are the values that Islam always subscribes to. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet of Islam actually said, fasting is not only about abstaining from eating and drinking, it's beyond that. He said, Anyone who does not refrain from saying ill talk 
the negative side of it, telling lies, being insincere, being unfaithful, cheating, lying, becoming greedy or hating or using the words of hatred, not the word of compassion or the word of uh, uh, accommodating others. مَنْ لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ And then they acted upon those negative words, negative values. فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً Then Almighty Allah is not in need and yada ta'ama huwa sharaba for anyone to abstain from eating and drinking. Yes. So there are two words we have to learn today. One mm-hmm. is siyam and the other one is sawm. Siyam is about abstaining from eating and drinking. Sawm is abstaining from all evil talks and action. That's why the Prophet of Islam said, "Wala sawma illa bil kafya an maharimillah." And there is no fasting except from refraining from all evil acts and thoughts and emotions. Beautiful. If we take that point about Psalm, so how can we connect and avoid all evil things and connect with the values of Ramadan? Yeah. Oh, see, see, then Ramadan comes as a, a form, a time to reflect. It, it is time to to acquire one of the most powerful value or virtue or quality that should anyone get that attribute, then that person truly becomes successful. Look around all successful people. They do have that quality. Look at all good people. They have that quality. Look at people who have really made it in life. Mm-hmm. You'll find that they do have that quality. And that quality is called the quality of discipline. Disciplining oneself to do what is right and disciplining oneself from refraining from doing what is wrong. Irrespective of circumstances, irrespective of situation, irrespective of environment. And to acquire that discipline, we need to awaken one of the most powerful forces on earth that has been given to us. And that is the willpower. Willpower is the ability to control thoughts and emotions and to make them do what is right. So if anyone can make thoughts and emotions work together towards doing a noble cause, a good cause, then they have activated the willpower. And who wouldn't want to have that quality of willpower? Definitely. definitely. Yeah, so to get that willpower working, we need to d- discipline. We need discipline. So the month of Ramadan comes as an opportunity for people to practice that discipline in the form of abstaining from eating, drinking, and evil acts. And they have one full month to practice that to truly get the stamina, get acquainted with it, and to transform this quality into a habit. So that is why Ramadan is here for the full month. And I believe, Sheikh Hassan, one of the challenging things is discipline. This is when we give the example of when we welcome Ramadan, we have the best of intentions, we're looking forward to it. Then by the end of Ramadan, the outcome wasn't as expected. So if you could talk more about how we can awaken that willpower of discipline. Yeah. Uh, Discipline, uh, describing discipline, how can you describe? Discipline is to do what you have to do when you have to do it, whether you feel like it or not. That is how we define discipline. Is to do what you have to do, mm-hmm. when you have to do it, whether you feel like it or not. So it involves thoughts, emotions, and action. So the three come together. And what we tell people is that the way discipline is acquired is one step at a time. To change, people don't change overnight. You cannot change your destiny, but you can change your destination. Mm-hmm. You can change. The, 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 you can reset the sail of wind, or the, the, the sail of your, or your ship, or whatever. You cannot change the wind, but you can change the sail or the direction of the sail, the set of the sail, and that is what is going to take you. So the way to acquire discipline is start small. By starting small, select what one quality would you want to acquire in the month of Ramadan. So by the end of Ramadan, it's already part and parcel of your life. It's a habit. Let's say, for example, people have been casual about their prayers Mm. or have been casual about reciting the Holy Quran or have been casual in their relationship with their parents, with their family, with their spouse, with children or they've been casual in their relationship with Allah or they have not been uh, punctual in their time management or they they procrastinate or whatever it is. Or maybe sometimes people, uh, let's say the negative part of it, people have been... um, the erupt with anger for no reason. They cannot control their emotions. Or people have not, for example, been able to to gain confidence in whatever they want to do. They've always been doubtful of themselves. Whatever it is, 
one chooses one quality and says, I wish I can acquire this quality or I can get rid of this quality. And then they make the intention, the niyyah. Every day acts is based on intentions. And with that they say now, I'm going to begin to practice one step at a time. First day they say, okay, I'm going to give my day today to practice this quality. And the trick here is the opposite of what people are used to. Mm-hmm. The reality in life, we always catch people doing something wrong. And we tell them. Yeah. So we say, no, change that. Turn it around and say, catch me doing something right. Okay. So when you see yourself doing something right, you reward yourself. To make it even work better, find people who can support you in the mission of transformation and tell them of your intent. And tell them, when you see me acquiring this new behavior or this new attitude or this new quality, let me know. Give me feedback. Give me a signal. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a high five. Tell me something to encourage me that you are doing it. It's not the opposite. So catch me doing something right. That could be the best way. So we take it one step at a time, mm-hmm. one quality at a time, and then you catch yourself doing something right. Because by catching yourself something doing right, you are actually elevating your self-esteem, you are boosting your self-esteem, you feel confident, and because you feel confident, and because you're a winner, you'd want to win again. And that is how you program your subconscious mind, you program yourself to become successful in what you do. Is it linked to positive thinking? It has to do with positive thinking. The Prophet mm-hmm. of Islam said, Tafa'alu bil khairi tajidu. Tafa'alu bil khairi tajidu. Be positive, be positive, be optimistic, and so it shall be. So with that, a good thing to do in the morning and before you go to bed is to repeat a statement to yourself a few times. Mm-hmm. And the more you repeat, the better. And that statement is to say, I believe something wonderful is going to happen to me today. The more you repeat that statement, the more opportunities you're going to see before you of beautiful things happening to you. Yeah, I believe something wonderful is going to happen to me today. Repeating that statement many times is setting the expectation. And most of the time, you will not be let down because you have set that expectation to yourself. So that's, I believe something wonderful will happen to me today. today. And I yeah. think we can right now make that commitment to start our day in Ramadan and absolutely. with that statement. And I believe something wonderful has already happened to me to, to, today. Yes. Number one is to, to, to be alive, to witness the month of Ramadan. Number two is for me to be on the radio again and to connect with our, our, our dear listeners. Alhamdulillah. And we are blessed to be connected with you. Indeed. Thank you so Alhamdulillah. much. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we remind our dear listeners that you can call in at 246-02058. That's 246-02058. We'll be happy to welcome any questions or comments that you have. And now we'll go on a quick break and we'll be back. Best companionship. Sometimes things are best kept between yourself and Allah. The world and people are not able to listen to your heart, but Allah does. The words in your heart are already heard by Allah even before you say it. Truly, in the heart, there is a void that cannot be removed except with the company of Allah, and in it, there is a sadness that cannot be removed except with the happiness of knowing Allah and being true to Him, and in it, there is an emptiness that cannot be filled except with love for Him, and by turning to Him and always remembering Him, And if a person were given all of the world and what's in it, it would not fill this emptiness. A thought by Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya. Welcome back. Sheikh Hassan, before the break, you've highlighted the point of focusing on a certain quality that we want to transform in ourselves and to take it step by step because we all have, um, we are on different levels in our journeys. And you also mentioned starting the day in a positive note, thinking that something wonderful will happen. However, we also notice a challenge that despite having that intention, Ramadan 
stereotypes of overeating, um, having lack of sleep or oversleeping or feeling exhausted are common things that we notice. Why mm. is that? Yeah. In reality, is that uh, with, with Ramadan, the first few days is when the body gets adjusted. Is when the body gets adjusted with respect to uh, the timing of eating, the time of drinking, the time of sleep, the time of prayers. So our biological clock is our biological clock is actually going through a little bit of uh, readjustment. So the first few days it's quite normal for people to feel uh, uncomfortable. It's quite normal for people to crave for something they got used to and now they're missing it. So we're gonna see some withdrawal symptoms. People who got used to the morning coffee or the morning breakfast or the morning nourishment and now they miss it. Or people who go to have a good sleep at night now because of the night prayers, uh, they're breaking the sleep a bit. Mm -hmm. So for the first few days, probably three days, it's going to be, the body is going to require time to adjust. And with that adjustment, we ought to get into shape quickly. And that's why we did uh, encourage our listeners through different programs to try and make that adjustment in the previous month to make sure that when Ramadan is here, people are ready for it. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, those who have missed the boat and now Ramadan is here, yes, the first few days you may feel a bit uh, awkward, but then get, get into shape, into, into tune, into rhythm very quickly. And once you get into that rhythm, then it becomes natural. Now you have learned to go without eating and drinking. It's quite normal. You don't miss it as much. Uh, your eating times have already changed, so your body has adjusted in terms of the digestive system and the uh, the way the body takes the nourishment. Uh, so now that you're into the rhythm, mm -hmm. get your act together and begin to organize your time to make sure that you capitalize on your time and you give every faculty of your life the intended attention it deserves. So there is the eight a faculties of life that one has to always make sure that they balance. And the first one, for example, would be the, the spiritual life. And in the month of Ramadan, we need to capitalize on that and increase, intensify our devotion towards our Creator in our prayers and recitation. So the, that part is going to see more of attention in the month of Ramadan than it used to in previous months. And then there is a part of health and energy. Mm -hmm. For you to uh, survive the month of Ramadan and for you to be able to fulfill your duties at home, at work, in society, you need a healthy body. So make sure what you eat is also healthy. You are what you eat. Mm -hmm. And number three is about loving relationship. Loving relationship with with the family, with spouse, with children, with their parents, with relatives, as well as with society. It's the month of connection. So with that, again, uh, it's good to connect with the society and with the, with the, the family and it's uh, family time. So make sure you give that uh, some time. And then there is a part of where the Quran was sent in the month of Ramadan and the first verse revealed the month of Ramadan was Iqra. And that is about seeking knowledge. And now that our mind is clearer and a lot of blood circulation doesn't go to the stomach to digest the food, there is more of that oxygen available for the mind. So the month of Ramadan ought to be the month of learning not the month of sleeping, not the month of being lazy, not the month of uh, uh, just being drowsy all the time and dozing off. It's the month of learning. So one has to set time to learn something new. Every day is even better. And then it's about the gift given to us from Allah that is in the form of talent, transforming that talent into skills. People want skills. They don't want talent. So how to transform that talent into skills is through practice. It's through uh, working, it's through uh, delivering, it's through exercise. So in the month of Ramadan, it's a chance to practice perfection. We have enough ordinary people in the world. What we lack are the extraordinary people. Mm -hmm. So make a mission in the month of Ram Ramadan to become extraordinary in what you do. In the, 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 the way you pray, in the way you recite the Quran, in the way you connect with your family, in the way you connect with society, in the way you learn, in the way you deliver your job and your duties at work. Become that extraordinary person because that is the intention of Ramadan. And then number six is about financial independence. Is that it's the ability with whatever we do to have a, a, a comfortable living. Yes, in the month of Ramadan, it's also in the month of trade. So with that, I would say that in the month of Ramadan, probably that would become a little bit less yeah, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, financial independence. But nevertheless, one can pursue it. And number seven is about social contribution. Give time to the society uh, in whatever form you can, in whatever capacity you can to support the community with your knowledge, with your time, 
with your energy, with your money, with your emotions, with whatever you can to support the community, make sure that you are there for the community. And finally, it's about leisure and pleasure. In the month of Ramadan, my suggestion would be give it maximum yourself, maybe one or two, two hours for leisure and pleasure. And if you can even transform that one hour, two hours to productive work, mm-hmm. then leisure and pleasure doesn't come. It becomes a passion in serving the community. Make it part of your leisure and pleasure. In reading, make it part of your leisure and pleasure. In prayers, make it part of your leisure and pleasure. In other words, transform becoming a good person, make it as a passion, and if it is a passion, then naturally becomes a leisure to do it. So okay. you don't need that uh, relaxation. Yes, with pleasure and le- with leisure and pleasure, we say make sure you have enough sleep because your body needs sleep. And Almighty Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata," And we have made you sleep to be the time for rest. Your body needs rest. Make sure you have minimum four hours, maximum eight hours of sleep. And that way you'll be able to function properly. Beautiful. So just to highlight for our listeners, you've mentioned focusing on our spiritual life, a core foundation, looking into our health and energy, looking into their aspects of loving relations, yeah. looking into what knowledge we can gain. Absolutely. And our financial independence. Indeed, yeah. The social contribution and the area of leisure and pleasure. Absolutely. Where that can also be part of the social contribution. Now, I'd like to actually take that a step back. And in order to focus on these areas, you mentioned we need to get into shape quickly. Yes. So perhaps there are listeners who did not prepare for Ramadan from before, and now but they want to make the best of it. So is there a way that we can get into the bandwagon quickly and make the best of it. Definitely. The, the clock is ticking. Yes. It's as simple as that. With the clock ticking, people are usually four types. And one can ask themselves, where am I and where should I be? The first category are the people who are active. Active people are capitalizing on the time that they have and they're trying to make the best out of it. And they're always active, they have an agenda and they usually go by it and uh, the time is filled with useful activities. Then you have a second category of people are the people who are reactive. They wait for something to happen for them to to react. And such people is that uh, they don't have a goal, uh, they have no purpose. They're just waiting to be told. And they're working for somebody else, for somebody else's goal. And in the absence of that, then they just sit and do nothing. And then you have category number three are the people who are passive. Passive people are the people who have given up in life. They realize that they have missed the, the boat, they've missed the life, they've missed the bandwagon, and they realize they don't have enough uh, capacity, enough intelligence, enough uh, skills, enough talent, and they feel useless. They have demeaned themselves to become valueless. And as mm-hmm. a result, they say, you know what, I'm hopeless, I can't do anything, I'm a failure, etc., and therefore they, they are passive. But there's hope. And there's always hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there is the category number four. In actual fact, although it is category number four, it ought to be number one. I delay that to number four mm-hmm. simply to show that this is what we have less of. We have enough people of, on, uh, who are active. We have even more people who are uh, reactive. And we have even more people who are pa- passive. <clears throat> what we lack are the category number four. Category number four are the people who are proactive. Proactive. Al-Mubadr. Proactive people are the people who don't wait. They can see beyond the horizon. They are one step ahead of everybody. They realize something is about to happen and they get ready for it. Successful people have that quality of being proactive. They know a season is coming and they prepare for it. They don't wait for the season to come and do something. They know difficult times are ahead and they prepare for it. They know change is about to happen and they prepare for it. They are proactive. So they are always one step ahead. Classical example. Let us take the weekend and what happened to shoppers. A majority of people went shopping for Ramadan the last day, just before Ramadan. Such people are reactive. They were just waiting, although they knew Ramadan was coming, but they didn't prepare for it. You will see the same people just before Eid. One night before Eid, they will all flood the market. True. They will all be there and shopping at the last minute. You see such people again just before school starts. The last day they go and buy the, the, the needs of the school. Such people, you see them about paying bills. Just before the bills get cut off, they go and pay the bills. 
you see such people always are just late or just about in time to meetings or most of the time they are quite late they are reactive they are driven by pain proactive people are driven by pleasure they are one step ahead they enjoy what they do and they truly prepare for it they plan for, for, for events so my suggestion would be for people how to get into shape quickly mm -hmm. become proactive Allah says in the Quran there are a few numbered days before we know it the days are over and already half a day is gone of Ramadan ask yes. yourself what have you done are you still trying to orient yourself if so you have already missed a good part of the, the first day yeah. so get into shape quickly and uh, do not procrastinate don't believe in hope that things are going to get better you have to get into shape that will power the discipline has to kick in very quickly wonderful so there you have it dear listeners it's our time is ticking it's our chance to be proactive set up the goals that we want to work on and make the best of Ramadan as a transformational journey absolutely lovely now Sheikh Afan we've discussed the elements of personal growth and development yeah. through Ramadan Indeed. let's also talk about the connection with Allah yeah. and it's a you know, an opportunity to connect and get closer to Allah. But first of all, what do we mean by that connection? Yeah. I think with connection with Allah, uh, people have different perception and understanding about connection with Allah. Some people see it as a burden, difficulties. Others see it as a, 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 something unnecessary. It's not a necessity of life. Why do I need to connect with Allah? Other, people's, uh, other people want to connect, but they don't know how. Others want to connect, but they're lazy. Again, we come to proactive people. They know why they connect, and they know the benefit behind it, and that's why they enjoy it. So the first thing is to go and understand why do we need to connect with Allah. As human beings, we came to this life without an operating manual. We came here, as Allah says in the Quran, أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شيئا. Allah brought you forth from the wounds of your mother, knowing nothing. And then he gave you the faculty of hearing, seeing, and the faculty of intellect, of reasoning. With these three faculties, then one is able to acquire all the knowledge and get programmed. Now, let us take a, a classical example. People who want to connect. There is an intrinsic part of us that has been programmed by Allah. In Islam, we call it fitra. The innate nature that we have within us of being good people. You see that in children. Children are so innocent, the innate nature is there. They have not been programmed yet by society. They mm -hmm. are pure from the manufacturer, from the creator. And then the society begins to shape them and uh, uh, program them and condition them to behave in specific ways and specific manners. So people begin to intervene with that programming originally set by Allah. Now with that in mind, People who understand why they have to connect, they realize that they need answers in life. They need direction. They need direction. And in that direction, people truly need to find uh, the purpose of connection. And that connection with Almighty Allah is when you realize you are connecting with the Supreme Intelligence, you are connecting with Almighty Allah, you are connecting with the one who has got all the answers, you are connecting with the one who is supporting you, who is supporting the universe and sustaining the universe. So you need him more than he needs you. And to connect Allah with Allah, you connect through your spirit. Through your spirit. The spirit is talking to us most of the time, but we are not listening because we have so much noise around us. To connect with Allah, people who have experienced it, they have so much ecstasy, so much pleasure, so much harmony, so much tranquility, so much peace of mind within themselves, they thoroughly enjoyed it and they want to experience to to repeat the experience more more than once every day mm -hmm. to get that to that level of ecstasy and that level of connection one has to find time to disconnect from everything else to disconnect from everything else you need quietness to quieten the mind you need to remove all the distractions, the phone, the mobile, the noise, the TV and the people around you. 
find a, an area where people can uh, uh, retreat and that's why we have the i'tikaf in the month of Ramadan retreating in the mosque specifically the last 10 days for mm-hmm. that purpose and in that moment sitting silent contemplating reflecting meditating trying to truly silence the mind and listening to the inner voice that inner voice is an inspiration from Allah talking to us so is it a moment of silence if you can explain more yeah the moment of silence indeed you need to create the time for it you need to allocate the time for it and you need to create the environment around it to be to be able to do that today unfortunately with the with the distractions we have with the the the, 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 the internet and and the media and the, the, the social uh, connections we really create those moments and because we don't know what we are missing yet we cannot appreciate it there is a saying in arabic mm-hmm. the one who doesn't know you does not value you and people who do not know how to connect with allah they do not value they don't know what they are missing so the month of ramadan is an opportunity to try and experience that albeit for five minutes those who have experienced it they felt empowered they felt emancipated they felt that suddenly they have been relieved now they become they realize all the shackles have been taken off and suddenly they realize they are somebody and they realize they've got more than what they think they don't have so what should be going on in our mind and heart in that moment of connection very very few things i'm going to give you a few questions mm-hmm. to help you okay. connect and to help our dear listeners to connect Let's take the, uh, one example. Imagine you knew beyond the shadow of doubt that you have 24 hours to mm-hmm. live. After 24 hours, you are gone. What would you do in the 24 hours remaining? Whatever answer you have, mm-hmm. write it down. That becomes your priority in life. Now imagine you don't have 24 hours, you only have one hour. Yeah. And with that one hour, what will be the most important thing in your life? And immediately, all the distractions in life become secondary. And you focus on key, important things in your life. As a Muslim, the first thing people would say, I would truly want to square my life with Allah. Mm -hmm. Through repentance, through seeking forgiveness, and through prayers, and seeking for a better life beyond. Number two that would come on the list would be the family. People mm-hmm. will try now to square things with the family, seek forgiveness uh, from the family, people who they have wronged. And they would only also want to express whatever they have not expressed in their lives, whether it is in the form of appreciation or the love or how much they value the family, when in the past they were they used the family and abused the family. And number three probably would then be their closest friends and uh, relatives and others. So suddenly you you realize, you know what, this is what matters to me the most. And then you go and question yourself. Have I been faithful to these relationships with Allah, with my family, with myself? Or have I been abusing it or taking it for granted? And there you are. The, immediately by just posing that question, I only have one hour to live or 24 hours to live. Suddenly, mm-hmm. priorities emerged, emerge. And when they emerge, you truly know exactly what you have to do. You don't need a teacher, you don't need lessons, you don't need classes. The second question to ask with regard to your family and relatives is to say, is to ask, if you knew beyond the shadow of doubt that a member of your family has got only 24 hours to live, what would you do, what would you do differently to that person before they depart? Whatever you would do, do it today because you have no guarantee that that person is going to be here for the next 24 hours. And that way, and this is how successful people and pious people do. They Mm -hmm. always ask, time is of a paramount importance. Departing from this life can happen at any moment. Therefore, as the saying goes, when you do your plans for this life, plan as if you're here to stay forever. وَعْمَلْ لِآخِرَتِكَ كَأَنَّكَ تَمُوتُ غَدَا And do for, you the, for your other life, for the life of hereafter, as if you're going to die tomorrow. 
And by making that distinction between the worldly life and the spiritual beyond this life, one can then begin to maintain the priority in the right order. And by the way, mm-hmm. working for the life of year after is not 24-7. It's just a few hours a day. It could even be a few minutes a day. As long as you do it properly, you do it rightly, and you do it consistently, then you're on the right track. So when people try to con- <coughs> connect with Allah, <coughs> they ought not to see it as a as a burden. The Prophet of Islam used to say, Arahna biha ya Bilal. Through prayers, make us have rest or relaxation or peace through prayers. So people who wanted solace, people who wanted tranquility, they wanted peace, they wanted harmony, they wanted peace of mind, it was through prayer that they were able to do that. It's just like making a phone call to someone, to a coach, Mm -hmm. to a mentor, to someone you revere, to someone you respect, to someone who's got wisdom, and you have problems in your life. You make that phone call, you hear a few words of wisdom, a few advice, at the same time there is empathy at the other end, appreciating what you go through, and suddenly you feel comfortable. You feel relaxed, you feel relieved. That is the same thing connecting with Allah. Those who have problems in life, they are burdened, irrespective of the creed, irrespective of the nationality, of the gender, of the belief, when they connect with Allah, <coughs> and, they, <coughs> and they make that connection true and sincere, usually they get answers, and they immediately feel comfort, peace, tranquility, mm-hmm. harmony, and that peace of mind. So, Shaila finds a chance to evaluate our life. Absolutely. And where we stand. And you've mentioned it's a chance to prioritize. And that's a very powerful question if we think we only have 24 hours because we'll eliminate many of the distractions. Absolutely. And uh, as you've mentioned, Ramadan is a great opportunity for us now to reorient ourselves. So, Sheikh we've we've talked about the values uh, of Ramadan and how we can benefit as a you know personal transformation and connecting with Allah. Can we all achieve that connection regardless of the level we come from? There might be people listening now who feel they're very far from Allah right now, and they feel that maybe I'm not ready to achieve that connection. Yeah, it's never too late. Whatever you are, <clears throat> whoever you are, in whatever condition circumstances you are. <clears throat> irrespective of your past it doesn't matter where you came from what matters is where you're going to end mm-hmm. it doesn't matter where you came from in other words your history your past doesn't matter what matters is how you're going to finish how you're going to end so today could be your first day of your transformation mm-hmm. Allah does not look at people based on their past Allah with Allah, He says to me, irrespective of what you have done in the past, when you feel you are ready to square things with me, when you are ready to make it better, I am ready for you. And there is a saying in Chinese that they say, when the, te- when the student is ready, the teacher will come or the master will come. Mm-hmm. So when you are ready for that transformation, with intention, with sincerity, with devotion, Allah is there waiting for you. He doesn't look at your past. And even he's even more happier when you try to make that connection. <clears throat> yes, people are at different levels. Mm-hmm. It's a journey. Some people have been working very hard and probably they, they can connect so quickly. Other people may struggle a bit. Some people feel that they don't connect at all. But the secret, <clears throat> the secret is this. Practice make perfect. Yes. By repeating time and time again, time and time again, eventually you're going to perfect that connection. Whether it is in sports, whether it is in stamina, whether it is in acquiring any particular skill, whatever it is, practice make perfect. People who become champions, they didn't become champions just by wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. It went with a lot of hard work of training and practicing. Same thing, people who wanted to connect with Allah, it didn't come by chance or by the looks or by the heritage or by the color or by the creed or by the gender. It came by hard work. And that hard work is to say, I truly want this. When people say, I truly want this and they believe they can have it and they keep on practicing, it makes perfect. And that's why you have one month to practice. You have one month to practice. 
and uh, the, a lot of congregational prayers are offered in the month of Ramadan yes. in different mosques. Again, is to ensure that we have more practice in the month of Ramadan. That's why people recite the Quran more in the month of Ramadan. Again, it's an opportunity to practice reciting the Quran to get that connection. Mm-hmm. As long as we have clear intentions and we truly want it, and we put a little bit of an effort towards that, definitely anyone and anybody can connect. And Quran, by the way, just to clarify things, is not there for Muslims alone. Quran is there for mankind. In the verses of Ramadan, Almighty Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan is when Quran was sent down. Hudan linnas, a guidance for mankind. It's not a guidance for Muslims only. Mm. A guidance for mankind. Mankind in it, it covers everybody, envelops everybody. Beautiful. On that note, Sheikh Afan, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk more about the value for all mankind. Inshallah. This is Radio Sultan of Oman. Our listeners, now it's time for a call to prayers, Adhan al-Dhuhr, according to the local timing of Muscat and its suburbs. Those who reside outside Muscat Governorate have to notice the difference in timing. Radio Sultanate of Oman. Check al final Isri on on let's connect. let's connect. <clears throat> Welcome back to Let's Connect. If you want to call in, you can call in at the number two four six zero two zero five eight. That's two four six zero two zero five eight. So, Sheikh Afan, before we took the break, um, from what I understood, you've mentioned the importance of practicing to make perfect and yeah. that we can all achieve that connection regardless of the level of spirituality that we are in. Even if we feel we've been very far from Allah, it's just about the readiness and the practice we put into it. Yeah. And you also mentioned that Quran is not just for the Muslims, it's for the whole of mankind. Yeah. So that brings me to the question, how can non-Muslims also benefit from the month of Ramadan? Yeah, non-Muslims can benefit from the, month of Ram- from the month of Ramadan in many ways. Number one, if you are already in a, in a Muslim practicing country, it's an opportunity for you to give it a try. For you to feel what Muslims are going through and experience it at first hand. Uh, simply because uh, you have uh, everybody, almost everybody doing it, specifically here in Oman, majority are doing it. So that is an opportunity for you to feel what they go through. The first few days indeed may be a bit tough. Uh, and yes, the body may crave for whatever you got used to. Uh, if you want to feel the spirituality part of it, my suggestion would be is to listen to the Holy Quran being recited. That is available either on the radio or on the internet. Just listen 
And would that be in Arabic if they don't? In speak? Arabic, listening to it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter with an Arabic speaker or an non-Arabic speaker. Listening to the melody of the Quran being recited okay. in itself, a lot of non-Muslims who eventually accepted Islam. When I asked them what impressed you the most, what was the influencing factor, a lot of people said, when I listened to the Quran, I felt something within me. I felt the peace. I felt the shiver. I felt that this is something really incredible. It brings with it a lot of uh, tranquility, peace, and uh, harmony that we talked about. For example, uh, in the past uh, week only, about three or four people embraced Islam, and I was uh, lucky enough to witness, uh, to make them uh, uh, utter Mm -hmm. the declaration of faith. And almost without failure, whenever they uttered the declaration of faith in Arabic, which is, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, meaning that I declare and uh, there's no one who deserves to be worshipped except Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah the mere fact of reciting the the declaration of faith some of them it was overwhelming they broke down in tears and they said I felt as if a big burden has been taken off my shoulder and I felt a shiver and I felt that yes now I'm light and I feel emancipated and uh, it goes to show that Mm -hmm. such people made that connection for that short moment so to make that connection to summarize that indeed listen to the Quran try to fast find a quiet place a comfortable place and uh, just listen to it and then if you truly then want to connect thereafter get a copy of the Holy Quran in the language that you understand the the translation of the meaning and just read when you read the Quran don't read it just like a book Read it as if it is a message intended for you. What are these words trying to tell me? Somebody is communicating with me through this book. And every line, every verse is intended to be me. It's directed towards me. What is he telling me? Mm-hmm. By mere focusing, understanding, trying to find what he's saying, the wisdom behind it, one can begin to say, yes, somebody is talking to me and that whoever is talking to me is none other than Allah. So it's a chance to connect with spirituality, especially being in a, in a Muslim country and the best month of Ramadan. Yeah. And the other thing about connection with with Allah uh, to non-Muslims, it does not mean that you have to go and uh, transform your life totally different. You remain who you are. You cannot change your identity and you shouldn't change your identity. And uh, the only thing that is asking you is whatever you do in life, make sure you do it right. You do it with uh, consciousness and you do it with high moral values. And here maybe non-Muslims would go and ask, he says, then what happens to Muslims? Why don't we see these high moral values being practiced? Mm -hmm. Why do we see Muslims killing each other? And we say, well, those are not Muslims. Those who do that, they are not Muslims. They may claim to be Muslims, but they have misunderstood Islam. They misunderstood Islam and they are not representing Islam. How can we say they're not connected to the faith? They are not connected and they're not representing Islam. Full stop. Because Islam talks about preserving life, preserving about high moral values, and what they do has nothing to do with Islam. That has to do with politics. Mm-hmm. And politics is not religion. It's not Islam. The way it is being practiced now, all over the world. And politics is a dirty game. And because it's a dirty game, people who then try to use Islam or use religion to drive political agendas, we say they are abusing themselves, they are abusing the religion they are representing, and they are abusing mankind. And as such, they ought not even to be linked to any religion. They ought to be, say, to be put in a different category altogether. Mm -hmm. And I guess we see that across different faiths as well. Absolutely. Where religion is used for other reasons. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. Now, Shilafan, there's a social aspect as well of the month of Ramadan, and we're encouraged to give and think of others. Why is that important in this month? Yeah. You see, in life, Almighty Allah says that He created us to be different and He elevated us above each other in different forms and faculties. Uh, Allah is the one who made you His vicegerent on this earth, His representatives on His earth, on this earth. And He elevated you above each other different levels. 
that differentiation between people, whether it is on financial merits, whether it is on knowledge merits, whether it is in skills merit, in talent merit, in uh, moral uh, merits, different. We are there to complement each other and to support each other. So that you may serve each other, you may support each other. Without supporting each other, the month of Ramadan is a reminder that there are people on this earth who have not been blessed with the gift of food and provision, who probably go a day in, day out with a proper meal. Some of them, they may have only one meal. Some of them have no meal at all. Some of them have shelter. Some others don't have shelter. So the month of Ramadan is a reminder to experience what such people go through. Because experience, Mm -hmm. there is a statement that says, seeing is believing, experiencing is convincing. Seeing is believing, experience is convincing. So experiencing the pain of hunger, the pain of starvation, that is uncomfortable, and what it does to us then we need to go and appreciate that there are people who feel like this seven days a week, 365 days a year. What can we do to alleviate such pain? What can we do to support them and help them? Or at least to minimize that pain. So whatever we are able to save in the month of Ramadan, we are told then we need to go and donate it and give it to such people in the form of zakah, in the form of sadaqah, in the form of feeding the people who are breaking their fast in different forms. That way, we are building that social connection with such people. We bring solidarity together. We try to minimize the gap between the rich and poor, at least in the provision of eating and drinking, as a basic human necessity. In the Maslow hierarchy of needs, Mm -hmm. he talks about the basic needs is all about food, shelter, yeah, and security. Can we at least provide that dignity to such people, provide them with food and shelter and a bit of security, we can contribute to that. So we are told, rich as we are, whatever we have is not does not belong to us, it belongs to Allah. And expend from the wealth of Allah. It is Allah's wealth, it's not ours. We are merely uh, trustees of that wealth. And spend from what Allah has made you as a trustee that He has given you. So we are His trustee with whatever we have on this earth, on this earth, our lives, our wealth, our property, our business. Everything we have belongs to Allah. And as such, we need to be good citizens to ensure that. And Allah is not asking much. He says, from whatever you have, give away two and a half percent. Two and a half percent is nothing. If you understand that people spend about thirty to forty percent of what they earn merely to that goes to food that is the statistics that came out and 20% of that of, of uh, whatever people earn they spend it on meat meat and chicken and uh, food, food. Mm. And, and, and you know one particular type of food yeah and in the protein part of it so you can see that yes 2.5% would be nothing to give away to people who are poor and needy so it creates a sense of uh, empathy when we think of others and I'd also like to focus on what is the best way to give. You've mentioned donations. You mentioned the financial area. Is there? Can we give in other ways? The best way to give is to do it directly oneself. To, and the Quran says, <clears throat> if you can find people who truly need, people who are below the poverty line, they are called faqir. Faqir is below the poverty line. Miskin is the one who can make the ends meet, barely make the ends meet. So there's a different category. Al-Faqir, the way Allah mentions the Faqir in the Quran, He says, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الَّذِينَ أُحْصِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The poor there, there, are the ones who have been uh, uh, basically confined, unable to move on this vastness of this land because they have no means of moving around. لَا سَطِيعُونَ ضَرْبًا فِي الْأَرْضِ يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُ أَغْنِيَاءَ مِنَ التَّعَفُّفِ Rich people would think that our people would think that these people are rich from the way they have dignity within themselves, yeah, they do not show their poverty. They do not show mm-hmm. how much they need. They have that element of dignity. تعرفهم بسيماهم You shall know them by their signs. لا يسألون الناس الحافة They do not go insistently begging. 
to find that person is a treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. If you can find that person, you have hit a jackpot. Then it is your duty to go and give with grace so that that person does not feel that their dignity has been uh, taken away. Giving with grace is to say to such people, this is not me doing you a favor. It is you doing me a favor by accepting this gift. This is your entitlement from Allah. And in actual fact, when we give zakah, we have to tell the person that this is zakah. Because if they don't deserve it, they will not, should not take it. It's to let them know this is your right, this is your portion of zakah, you are entitled to it, please take it with grace. Yeah. So in making that connection, in making that link, and in making sure that we give it with grace, and people accept it with grace, it doesn't follow that we make them feel guilty or make them feel uh, less valued, or make them feel that they're nothing, that we're doing them a favor. Mm -hmm. We ought not to look at them with an eye of kibriya, uh, with mm -hmm. an eye of arrogance, that I'm doing you a favor. I'm doing you no, know, it's not a favor. You are doing yourself a favor by giving them, by them accepting it. Yes. So whenever you give that, then give it. Don't even ask them to say thank you. They ought not even to say thank you because it's, they're not obliged to do that. It's a duty. When you get your salary, you don't go to the management and say thank you for the salary. It was your entitlement. Same thing with zakah. So let us bring that element of dignity to such people with grace mm -hmm. by supporting them. The empathy. Do it directly. Don't donate to, to some other charity, charitable funds. You can do that. But the question was, how can the best way to do it is to do it directly yourself. Excellent. Giving with grace. Now, Sheikh Afan, as we wrap up for the show, um, I'd like us to imagine that it's the last day of Ramadan right now. And we are all looking back and we see that our Ramadan has been successful. What is the key element that we can all take away that made the Ramadan successful? The, the key thing to remember is that to say that have I been a better person? Have I grown in my uh, moral values, my spiritual values, my emotional values, my intellectual values, my social values? If you have become a better person and you have connected more with Allah, with self and society, then you say Ramadan has been beneficial for you. Beautiful. So we'll keep that in mind. Have I been a better person? Indeed. And that's a way for us to then assess how well we've done in Ramadan. Mm. Well, thank you very much. With that, we come to the end of our show today. Let's connect. We'll be back tomorrow, the same time, 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And it repeats 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. And as always, we welcome your calls at the number 246-02058. So we'll say goodbye from your host here, Reem Audia, with Honorable Sheikh al Fan Al-Aisri and the sound engineer, Safiya Al-Habsi. From all of us here, Ramadan Mubarak with peace and love.